Welcome to this episode of Bounded in a Nutshell. Remember to take a moment to click on the link below to donate to a very special organization. Figure Skating in Harlem is the first organization in the world to combine the power of education with the grace and discipline of figure skating. It is dedicated to developing confidence, leadership, and academic achievement in young girls from low-income backgrounds. The numerous stories of success from its alumni owe a great deal to the unique blend of mentoring and self-expression that is championed by FSH. Remember, no donation is too small or too large to keep the dream alive for these exceptional young girls. Thank you very much. Enjoy the show. Start from the story of that professor sending you down the street again. The professor told me that I should go. Am I, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we've got you back The professor told me I should go see a member of the wedding, and there was an actor named Mubarak Mahmoud, black actor, who had cut the corners of his mouth years and years ago when he was doing classical theater. So I said, I'm going to go see this guy. And I, I went to see the play, and I sent him a note saying, I'm a, I'm a theater student, and I would love to meet you and say hello. And he's in, in the, the, comp, the, the uh, stage manager, I mean, the um, uh, house manager took me back. And all I wanted to see is did he cut the corners of his mouth to round the syllable, the round the vowels. Jesus. things. And he had cut, and I saw the little marks, the little stitch marks where he had cut the corners of his mouth. And I said, nah, I'm going to make these lips work for me. <laughs> and I'm going to learn to do this stuff. Oh, and my he God. Had but anyway, you, I just yeah. had to add that. <laughs> I mean, that's just. I just need to sit with that for a second that as recently as then that sort of mutilation was happening because well, you were told your lips couldn't, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's a lot to sink in, you know? It's, I think, think we got to be careful as students and as teachers of what we say to people to mm. try to deter them or motivate them or whatever it is. It's just wrong. You never tell a student what they can't do. You could tell them what they need to do if they want to do this, mm -hmm. you know, because everything is possible. Everything is possible. But it's like, are you willing to take that journey and, and make the sacrifices? Yeah. You know, um, so anyway. So you Journey, me, George C. Wolf, how did you guys, because was it George that first directed you at the Delacorte? No, it was, it was uh, Mary Zimmerman. Directed Mary Zimmerman, okay. How, no, how did you know? No, 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 no. It was actually a British director that directed me in Measure for Measure. That was my first one. All right, one. that was your first Measure for Measure. So how did you, what was that like, finally getting on the Delacorte and, and that day? How did that come about? Well, I'm, I'm certain it has something to do with, with uh, uh, Rosemary Tischler, you know, right. because she was a fan from the beginning. She knew a friend of mine from, from, uh, from college who told, who told me to go visit her when I came to New York. And eventually, she kept letting me in auditions. And this, uh, and I'm sure George pushed it a lot. Yeah, you know, and I, I went in and won the role of Lucio, which I loved. And it was funny because to walk into rehearsal the way I am and then start waxing the language and then go back to what I am, it was baffling everybody around. How do you keep doing that? How do you stand there and, and mix Lucio with street and classic? I said, well, that's who he is. And it was set in the 40s on a Caribbean island. And I had like a double breasted suit on with a big Borsalino, uh Panama straw, two-tone shoes. Basically you know, how you were dressing normally anyway, Ruben. Yes. You know. yes. <laughs> so, you know, instead of hail virgin if you be, as those cheek roses proclaim, I was hail virgin if you be. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, you know, obviously everybody was laughing at first in rehearsal until the first performance. And when I came out for my, my, my curtain call, the audience stood up. Wow. I mean, the whole way I waxed, and then I would stop, and then I would flip it and start doing really straight classic, just, you know, real straight. And then I would say, like, nay, sir, sit. I would say, nay, sir, sit. <laughs> and then I would go, you know, yeah. it, was, yeah. it was, that was my first Well, let's time. talk about that. Let's, before we, you know, just to, because a big part of, it's a big part of acting, but I, I think it's most dangerous and easiest to lose track of when doing the classics and certainly Shakespeare. We're, we're, we're taught so many ways or we have in our heads so many images of how it should be. People saying to you, this is a new street. When your journey was always about never letting go of Reuben and bringing Reuben to Shakespeare and finding where they met. For the people watching and stuff, just tell us a little bit about that because I mean, the number of times you'll tell, you've been in audition rooms as a director 
and actors will come in and they'll chat to you and it'll be great, they'll be natural, and then they kick into the language and it suddenly becomes this weird mannerism thing and stuff. How what's your what's your approach and feeling about, I mean, keeping a real strong sense of yourself and bringing the language to meet you somewhere. You know what I mean? I think first of all, if it's a style of theater or a particular writer, I think you need to master that writer or at least be very familiar or more than competent in that writer's style. Yes. Then once you master that, the, the most important thing about any role you play is bringing you the real you to it. Everything else right. is just light. Everything else is just fluff. Yeah. You know, so but first understand how, how Breck works, understand how Ibsen works, understand how Shakespeare works, uh, Strindberg, uh, uh, August Wilson. Before you start adding the thing that is the most important, the essence of who you are, you got mm -hmm. one set of emotions. You have one brain and it will process, given the facts of that character, given the facts of the, the script that's in front of you, which is the law. Given the fact that, okay, the guy is blind, okay, the guy is uh, uh, sexually ambiguous, okay, the, mm -hmm. the guy is uh, a dimwit, the guy is, mm -hmm. uh, he stutters. Use all those facts, but still yeah. you have to process it through your brain and your heart. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, and if you don't process that, if you try to, you know, become something, I'm, I'm something different. No, you're you. Mm -hmm. Given these facts, if it, if it says that I'm a, 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 a dwarf who's a Buddhist monk, that's exactly who Ruben's going to be. This Ruben is going to be that. Yeah, when, yeah. If I can make sure that I live that, you know, uh, on stage, you as the audience will buy it because I'm giving you something, the essence of something that's really real. So I never, I never really removed Ruben out of the equation because the only thing that we truly own uniquely is who we are. And, mm -hmm. and the person who fortified, who really made me understand that was Adolf Caesar, mm -hmm. who did a soldier, I did a soldier's play. Soldier, yeah, soldier's play, yeah. Adolf was a great classical actor. Yeah. And one day he that walked voice, in. That voice, that voice, my walked, God, yeah. He walked <laughs> in my dressing room and he said something from Othello. And I responded as Yago. Yeah. And he was like, boy, you know the classics. I said, yes, sir. And we started <laughs> waxing every day. And he was yeah. like, he, he fell, we fell for each other. We were just, he was a yeah. great mentor. To me. But he said to me, never remove you out of the equation of you lost the be best part of what you can do or the best part mm -hmm. of your portrayal. So I always keep that, you know, uh, with me. But first of all, master the style, you know, uh, that's most. I important. remember you told me a story about when we met. I can't believe we never met until, you know, uh, Othello, and you told me a story about a young actor who came into audition for one of the, you know, roles, smaller roles and stuff. And we were talking about responsibility as a director and you, he wasn't going to get the role. He was wrong for it. He, you know, he wasn't ready. But you said you couldn't let him leave the room with the audition he'd done. You had to, you had to send him out of that room with something else. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that and your response? Because you do a lot of teaching, you do a lot of mentoring, but as a director, when, uh, what you feel your responsibility is when working with young actors, particularly in that case, maybe use that case as a springboard, you know? It was, it was hard, man. He made all the wrong decisions, in my, mm -hmm. my opinion. Everything he did, it, it had no foundation. He was making these decisions about what he, how he wanted me to feel about what he was saying, opposed to how he felt about it. And it was yeah. terrible. The casting director halfway through it looked over at me like, are you going to stop this or let him go? And just let's go to the next person. We can't be here all day. And I let him finish. And I looked at him. And I walked up to him quietly. And, and, um, and I said to him, listen, quit trying to impress me. You know, find out what you really believe in about this character. Hang your hat on something that's real. I can't, I, you know, you got to do, you could do better. You, you got to do better. You can do better because you, you're you not real. So this is your time. And then I gave him a couple things to think about to, and asked him, did he want to go out and just do it again? He said, I'll, I'll do it again. And so I looked back at the cast director. I said, he's going to do it one more time. The cast director kind of sat back like, well, we're wasting our time. And he was much different and she asked me afterward you know that was really you know of course it wasted my time but it was really noble of you to I said it's not noble I just couldn't let him go back in the world and do this same audition with somebody else like that he'll never he'll never mm -hmm. work 
you know, and I couldn't let him walk out in the world like that. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm an actor too, man. You yeah. know? It just didn't feel good to me. So, I mean, I, that, I mean, let's move on to you, the, you as a, as a director and was it, were you always going to direct or is it something that as your body of work grew, you kept being drawn to it more and more? I do much better financially as an actor than a director. Yes. So I, I didn't need to direct. I didn't, I was drawn to directing by being in rooms with directors that were saying things to, to actors that were not clear, that, that, that kind of disturbed me, whether it was, I've heard a director give a note to, to an actor one time in front, it was the stupidest thing I'd ever heard. And I'm not directing, so I can't say anything. So I said to myself, these actors deserve better than that. Maybe if, if I work hard enough, I can give them better. Yeah. So yeah. I just said it was a necessity. It was like I've done I've done over a hundred plays, Chuck. I don't know how many you've done. You've probably done three hundred. Uh, no, no. <laughs> I've done over a hundred plays and I quit yeah. counting a hundred. And I just I just I mean hearing directors give notes like be a man or you love this bitch. Or excuse my French, but I mean I've heard that note given to him. Man, you love this bitch. Come on, let's do it again. I mean, what is that note? How is that yeah. useful? Tell yeah. me what is you. So I said to myself, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna direct, and I'll never say that to an actor. Yeah, I'll, I'll never say anything. And I'll, I've had to say to, to to a director one time, I can't use that note. Give me something. I need you. And well, you don't mm -hmm. want me to give you a note. I please give me a note that I can use mm -hmm. to tell me, man, you came in this room to uh, get your shoes. No, <laughs> that's what you <laughs> came into. The room. I, and I said to this director once, if I don't know why I came into the room. Um, you'd be asking, where's Ruben? He's standing outside the door because I'll never come in the room. Yeah. I'll never come in any room on stage. I don't know why I'm there. I know exactly why I'm in every room. Now, the intention will change once I get the information from what's inside that room. What mm -hmm. the other actor across from me says to me or does, the intention may change. The motivation, what's my priority may change, but mm -hmm. I'm not coming into a room. I don't need a director to tell me why I come into a room. And, and I don't mean to be belligerent. I don't mean to yeah. be hard. But that is the last thing a director needs to tell an actor. You got yeah. the wrong actor you've hired. Yeah. If, if you don't know why he came into the room. So the, the coming into the room, you're talking about what we all talk about, which is my why, what I want. Uh, those basic questions. Yes. Um, but, those base, they're actually those basic questions we ask. And it's the same thing. I mean, I know a lot of people watching are asking, always think about getting the job and walking into the audition room and stuff. And, everything that takes over the nerves the panic the thinking of rent the wanting to book this and stuff and i think you can basically squeeze that stuff out of the way by asking these kind of questions what you're talking about right now chuck listen an actor thinks his job is to go in in every room and get the job that's not an actor's job an actor's job is to go into every room and do your best and be impressive impress every room you walk in be impressive you're not going to get 85 percent of the jobs you and me ain't gonna get 85 yeah. percent the thing is this man your job is to do your best work and impress every room you walk in yeah because listen the director a, a, a good director is going to direct about three four plays a year that's a somebody that's working just as a director yeah. maybe five that casting director is going to cast 75 things, 100 <laughs> things, impress that room, by, yeah. and not by trying to impress them, by being that fine. Yeah. This, the key to this, this whole thing is the craft. I don't hire talent. Talent walks in the room. Every actor walks in his talent. I hire craft. I hire... Tell uh, us about that. Precision. Tell us that difference. Tell us that, uh, qualify that for us. Because every actor, once you weed through the finest casting directors, like a Heidi Griffiths, yeah. once you get past her, I know how good you are. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. so I'm not, I'm not weighing talent. It's a lot of elements that got to go in because everybody's talented. I'm looking for crafts. I'm looking for craft. And then also th there are other things that are very, very important. What do you bring in the process other than just talent? Mm -hmm. Are you nurturing? Are you, are, you, are, you, are you a good team player? Do you care? Are you compassionate? Are you gonna look out for other people? Or are you just gonna be an ass the whole time and get on everybody's nerves? There's a lot of things. And, and are you new? Are you old to the game? Are you stuck in your ways? I weigh the whole room because I gotta figure out where my energy is gonna go. Mm -hmm. I'm always bringing new people in, but you know, one or two, depending on how big the cast is, because I know I gotta give them more time most of the time. Mm -hmm. and, and, and if I see an actor I really want this right for this role, but they're gonna, they're gonna suck some energy out of the room, I gotta evaluate how much energy. 
because I need yeah. to give this person time, that person time, you know, everybody time, mm -hmm. you know, and, and if I don't know, that's why I meet people. I just don't, you know, like me. Yeah, and that's you, what we did. We, we met, met, we met for, for Othello. We, we sat and had a, an amazing, I mean, we must've been in there for 90 minutes talking, yeah. you know? And yeah. we decided we'd do some of the work because we were like, yeah, let's get, let's do some of this, man. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. You. I didn't require you to do that. I didn't need to see how talented you were. I, I was smitten by you way before in two, three plays prior to that. I knew how talented you were. I don't. I want to know about Chuck the man. I want to know, and the artist, what does he expect? What does he want from me? What can I get from him? Does he, well, is he willing to take the challenge of what I expect from him? You know. And that's and, something actors should know when they walk into the room is, is, it's almost, I always think of it almost like dating. What is it about you that makes that person want you? Do you know what I mean? And we often lose our essence in pursuit of the job when in fact it's our essence that's gonna get us that job in the first place, you know if, what I mean? If you find at what you do, mm -hmm. if people, no one wants an inferior product. Yeah. What, and what you're selling, unless they just can't afford better. And yeah. what you're <laughs> selling is a product. You're yeah. selling a craft a skill, because the talent is there. You take the talent and you turn it into a product. It's marketable. Mm -hmm. Somebody needs it. Somebody mm -hmm. wants it. And you yeah. keep going into rooms and selling it, saying, is this what you're looking for? Is this what you're looking for? Well, you might not know it, but I know it. So yeah. you have to choose you before you go into the room expecting them to choose you. Yeah. You dig what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. The only way you could choose you is if you're that fine at what you do. I'm not talking about ego. Ego is ridiculous. Yeah. I'm talking about confidence and confidence is bred by preparation preparation i mean once you get confident once you say i know this work i understand othello in and out it's still more to learn yeah. and that's the way you come in i gotta learn but i get watch this foundation i'm gonna put down and let's build a house on it yeah but, yeah but the thing is if you get fine at what you do i don't care if it's a butcher a carpenter a a a a, 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 a knitting if you get fine at it somebody wants it Somebody said, I want that. That's, that's fine. That's, that's, if someone should frame that saying, if you can be fine at it, somebody wants it. Let me ask you, since we're on the topic, we'll circle back. God, there's so much I want to talk to you about. Um, let's talk about, my big question to you is, why the hell haven't you played Othello? Because I know we've had a discussion about that. And what that play because you know you have so much history you will go back to the professor but you also have uh you uh, trying to join the and a black ensemble theater but because you're part puerto rican you know you're, you know i don't know if it's your dad or mom remember you tell that story of being denied because you they said you know we don't hire puerto ricans here but you're like I'm black. i mean race issues genie you know interracial marriage i mean you your energy and I remember you saying something specific when I asked you that question of why haven't you played Othello? And you said, you've never met anyone you trusted to take you through the journey. Tell us about coming to Othello at the public, why you haven't played it, are you gonna play it, do you want to play it, and what that play means in, in the whole scheme of theater as a whole, because it holds a special place in this world, doesn't it, that play? Yes, yes, you know, um... I, you gave the quote as the reason I never played it. I've been asked to play it at least at least four times, three or four mm -hmm. times. And I looked at the director and I was like, you know, I don't know if I trust this director because I'm going to give my heart and soul to it. As you well know, you cannot mm -hmm. approach that role any other way. Yeah. And I want to be safe. And I think all actors want to be safe, but there's certain roles that absolutely demand a higher level of safety because the, what you have to expose is the most vulnerable, the most vulnerable aspects and parts of humanity, mm -hmm. man mm -hmm. or woman. You're talking about giving your entire heart. There are roles I could play, and I don't have to skim over the surface, but to give my entire heart to it, the most vulnerable parts. I didn't trust none, none of those directors, because every time I see Othello, and I've seen it with fine actors, James mm -hmm. Earl Jones, I've seen it with Keith David, I've seen yeah. them with fine actors, and, 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 and Yago makes a fool out of them, and the director allows it. Yago's mm -hmm. peeking around poles, looking at the audience, smiling, moving curtains aside, laughing, winking, you know, talking to Othello like he's dumb, and Othello's like, yes, for real? Yeah, yeah, you know, and I'm saying, I cannot have that, because it's going to not be a good situation for me or anybody in the cast, because I'm going to start saying, <laughs> I mean, I was doing Henry VIII, 
and this actor was way upstage because Henry the Eighth is almost a thankless role. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. I mean, you'd be like, you the worst guy in the world. At least they <laughs> in, in, the, in the in the wrong director's hands, and so. You know, this actor was way upstage, just laughing and giggling about something. And I turned around. We were at the Delacour stage. I turned around and just stuck out my hand like this. I whipped my cape around and just stuck out my hand. And they didn't know what to do. Everybody was like, what is he doing? The actor just came over, kneeled down, kissed my ring. And then I flipped my cape and then I went to the other side and finished my, don't be upstage clowning with me. Now imagine what I would do. Imagine what I would do with a fellow. With yeah. Yago yeah. peeking around a pole. <laughs> I was like, I, you know, so I didn't find anybody that was that, that made me feel. I would love to have played it. I think I'm a little long in the tooth for it now. Um, I don't know. I don't think so. I but, think. I mean, I, 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 I don't really, with the exception of Hamlet. There's no role I've played as much as I've loved pretty much everything I've played that I feel any need to return to. I don't feel right now a need to ever return to Othello because that was such a special experience. I mean, that cast, you, the Delacorte. But I can see returning to it older. If I was ever going to do it, it was just to see what age has done to it for me. So I don't, I don't think I, I, I'd love to see your fellow still, man. I don't know. It's a lot of roles I want to play, but but in a, in a way, man, watching you play it, you know, and me and being able to direct you, almost I, I played it vicariously. I felt the things that I wanted to protect, wanted somebody to protect me from, I, I try to protect you from. I just I wanted to be beautiful and I wanted your love to be beautiful and all kind of elements were trying to destroy it and, 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 and evil wins and then it doesn't win. And I just wanted to protect you in a way I wanted to be protected and, and mm -hmm. you delivered on so many different levels. And it's like, and sometimes I would say, Chuck, I'm gonna do something. You say, really? And I'm saying, I'm telling you, it's gonna be beautiful. Just hang with me. You say, okay. And the thing I love about you is even if you have a different opinion, you ask the question, say, I'm wondering about that. And I say, trust it. And, and, but I, you know, and you say, okay, and you would try it. Not one thing that I asked you to do, did you not try? I cut some of your most beautiful speeches because I wanted the people to, to be in and out of that Delacorte in two hours and 45 minutes and still get the whole essence of the play. So everybody had to lose something that was valuable. Mm -hmm. And you and, and Desdemona probably the most. Um, yeah. And probably Iago. But uh, uh, you guys did it. I mean, some protested a little more than others. Yeah. <laughs> But the thing I'm, a, is, I'm a great, I'm, and I think it's trust. It goes back to the first question I asked you about trust. Is like, I only go into a project with that sense of trust. And once you give a sense of trust, you can't step back from the arrangement. The trust says, I'm going to trust you to have an overarching eye on this. I'll do, you know, so you have to try at least the first time. And that's another thing I noticed. Some people feel their process needs to be contradictory <laughs> and I actually believe the opposite is try it go for it because you'll surprise yourself I'm sitting here trying to figure out a character at home but that's just me and my head immediately by working with someone that's one more brain one more emotion one more set of life experiences that can help you that you don't have does that make sense so I've never understood not trying something first you know that's huge, um, that's huge. some people that's 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 you that's the generosity uh from you like there was a moment that i gave you and you were way upstage and it's before uh the murder and mm -hmm. and the women are doing their scene and i put your back to them and you were looking over the water contemplating on what you had to do mm -hmm. and and it was in in the way that jane cox lit it in the, in the way that Tony Leslie put this long, almost leopardish looking with earth tone colored cape on you, and you were standing there with your back, and every now and then the wind would hit it, and it would, that silk would flow, and you were like three levels deep in, 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 in depth of view. They were way downstage doing this gorgeous scene, Amelia and Desdemona, and, and uh, it was so gorgeous. And you, I remember when I first heard you said, but I'm way up here, nobody can see me. Yeah, you third level of view. <laughs> they check with you. And then, because I didn't want it to just seem like all of a sudden a fellow's at the door, I'm gonna kill you. And it's yeah. like, I want him to have to, I want the, the pathos, the pain, the journey, that it's not easy for you to do it. It doesn't happen in that room. I yeah. like seeing three or four things cooking and, yeah. and it's like cinematic. And one night, particularly it started raining and the mm -hmm. wind was blowing and the cape was going and them little raindrops were coming down and that light was going across. I said, oh my God, this actually is something. <laughs> and, but you, <laughs> it, you did it and you would never see how beautiful that, that is. 
but many people have walked up to me and said, oh my God, that right yeah. there. And when you walked yeah. into the room and I left you way over in that doorway and that yeah. light came from the doorway across to the bed and you just stood yeah. there. I said, Chuck, do not move, stay yeah. there. And so in your shadow cast around, you know, and at your height, at my height, that shadow went all the way across to the bed. And wow. you walked into that, that shadow, that beam to the bed. That was, I couldn't do that with every actor if I had to fight with them for two hours. I ain't got that much yeah. time in the rehearsal room, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but anyway. Thank you. I mean, those, I mean, you've given me goosebumps remembering that experience. It was extraordinary. I mean, the, 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 definitely the hardest role I've ever played, but the, one of the most beautiful. And I, people always ask, I will always say Hamlet's the greatest, Othello's the hardest. And the reward comes out of navigating that difficulty. Um, let's talk about, before I, I'm going to swing back to theatre, but, you know, you have this massive TV and film career also. Let's go to, to the Lackawanna Blues. I mean, was it hard? How did you decide which role you would play, given you'd... Yeah, I mean, not how did you decide. Was it hard watching other people step into the roles you embodied in the one-man show version of that play um, when you did the HBO uh, movie? Well, initially, it was difficult, you know, mm -hmm. because I, I know these people better than anybody else in the world unless you were in that room and house. I know the way they smell. I know mm -hmm. what they wore. I know, I know how they talk. I know the cadence of the way they talk, mm -hmm. uh, the tempo, the, te the, the timbre in their voices. Or the, or the, mm -hmm. Some actors talk like this. Some of the people in the house talk like that. You wouldn't mm -hmm. talk like that. That's just what they do. <laughs> So when I play the role, that's how I talk. You know, sometimes that's how you talk. So none of the actors would I tell this is the way they talk. You know what I'm saying? I let them grab and embody and embrace those characters and from their own essence, from their own experience. So it yeah. was hard for a minute, but then I figured you gotta sacrifice something. That's what mm -hmm. that's what art is. If you yeah. don't bring something to the altar and sacrifice something, then what are you there for? Right. And you got to check yourself and figure out what you bring into the altar. How selfless can you be? And the more selfless that you are, the more generous you are, you, mm -hmm. you know, that's where success is bred from. But when I, when I went to the set, I didn't choose to play any character. I just wanted to sit back and watch. It was the first film I had written, you know. And so I wanted to sit back and watch. And George kept looking for somebody to play this role of Freddie, Freddie Cobbs. Yeah. Said, somebody like Ruben, somebody like Ruben. And finally, finally he said, well, why don't you get up there and play it? <laughs> I didn't want. I said I don't want to play it. I just want to watch. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I ended up playing a role that, that they couldn't find anybody for. I mean, you, you. There are a lot of people who have a story to tell, and certainly people who want to write semi-autobiographical, about you know, sort of stories of themselves. I think. It's, can you tell us the the sort of cocktail of real, imagined, commercial? You know, that whole cocktail that has to go into doing something like you did, you know, as opposed, because everyone says, oh man, I have such an interesting story to tell, but not everyone can translate it onto a screenplay. Can you tell us a little bit about the decisions you make as to what to tell in the story, how you change characters, you know, just a little bit about that, you know? Well, well when you're talking about the play, you must be talking about the play. Yes, yes. Because the play is all fact. The play is yeah. no fudging. The play is yeah. no fudging anything. I just, the, the greatest help that I had in that was George C. Wolf and John Diaz. Right. John Diaz was the dramaturg on that. And dramaturg, and he, and he stayed on me about form. How do we tell a story? What do we need to tell a story? Mm -hmm. um, what are the beats of the story? What is the arc of each section of the story? And that was very important to me. And George was the truth meter. If I was doing something uh, or, or not, I didn't give my mother, because I was angry at my birth mother for leaving me. And one day it bothered me that she left me. And, uh, and so I didn't really write her role out well. I played her like, Nanny says, leave this child with me. And my mother was saying, okay. And so George called me in one day and said, is that real? I mean, she just said, okay. And I said, yeah, she probably did or she wouldn't have left me. And he said, that's wrong. And we argued. I go home, I get a phone call from George. George says, I want to talk to Ruben Santiago Hudson, the, the, the actor. I said, hold on for a minute. <laughs> Hello. And he says, uh, you're fired. I said, how are you going to fire me? To do? You, you can't fire me. I wrote it. I'm not talking to the writer. I'm talking to the actor. You're fired. I said, how many roles do you play? I said, I'm playing like 25 roles. He said, you're playing one. Come back tomorrow and I'll give you a job as one role. Aileen Hudson. That's my mother. 
So I came back to, you know, I thought about it. I was mad. You can fire me. I don't care. And then I came back the next day and all I did was stories about me and her. And I just stood for, I'll cry now. Mm -hmm. Cried. Mm -hmm. Just cried. And finally just kept carving it out till I carved out a scene about her leaving me, which is mm -hmm. the, the most profound short moments in the play. But it's mm -hmm. the pain of her having to give a child up. And, and later, later on, uh, when we did the play, Margot Jefferson was a critic at the time at the New York Times. And she had an uh, ar uh, article, a story saying, and the Tony will not go to. And she listed four performances. And she said, Ruben Santiago Hudson for Lackawanna Blues in the, in the three minutes that he plays his mother is the most profound three minutes in New York theater this year. She said that in the New York Times. Mm. And I didn't want to even go there with it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But is it that coming back to our point is George it's good to have other people. It's good to have other people. Do you know what I mean? Me. And years later, when and this is a personal, years later when my mother and I, we did come back together in a real good way. She went out and she was a heroin addict. She became a heroin addict for 20 over 23 years. And then she spent the last like almost 13 years of her life as a counselor, a drug counselor taking crack and, and heroin addicted girls off the streets of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania Hill. And we became very close in those last 12 years. We had a lot of conversations. And I asked her one day, I said, talk to me about that, you know, uh, about that leaving me. She said, I loved you. And I, let, I gave you a better life than what I could give you. And she said, but if I didn't love you, I wouldn't have laid down and had you. I wouldn't have carried you for nine months. I, I, I knew you didn't live the life I, I was gonna live. Didn't need that life. And it made me understand her that I did have to give her credit. You know what I mean? So be careful. Well, a brave about decision. A really brave where for what was going on, knowing herself decision for you. Yeah. Um, how does that... you got two beautiful kids, Trey and, and Lily, and a wonderful wife, Jeannie, and just the family. How, how has that played into your... You're such a... I mean the close we've all been over several times for dinner, the closeness of your family, the navigating of it, the, the, the dad, that basketball games with Lily and all that stuff of making them pushes. How did that, how does that experience um, sort of mold you as Reuben, uh, the father and husband? You I, know? I, I wanted to give them a life that I didn't have. I wanted a mother and a father and a dinner table and, you know, us sitting there, you know, I ate at a counter in a rooming house. We had a counter, we had a restaurant and yeah. it was loving. I mean, I had a ball, but I wanted to give them what is the, you know, a, a normal, uh, whatever that means, life. I wanted to give them a mother and a father, somebody that would not miss any events that they've ever had. I used to fly in from LA for just one day to see a Trey or Lily play basketball or do a play. Mm -hmm. Fly all the way back to do my TV series, you know, uh, and I wouldn't say anything. I wouldn't complain, I wouldn't say anything. They would look up for me and they'd see that I was in the audience. And, yeah. and I just know it meant a lot. And I wanted to give them a life that I, I didn't have. And so um, any lesson, I never had lessons in music. I never had lessons in swimming. I never had lessons. I had the friendship house where I did all those community things, but yeah. I never had lessons in anything. I gave them any lesson they ever said they wanted. Me and Jeannie say, okay, well, as long as you don't mess around and go ahead and do it, we'll give it to you. And that's, that's what drove me. Mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure that anything that they needed to, that, that was going to equip them to go into life and, and give it their all and be the best they could be. I wanted to, to with my wife, provide that for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why when I was in grad school and when I was an undergrad, when actors would say they couldn't tell their parents they were actors because their parents wouldn't support their college education. And I'm coming from a rooming house and yeah. Nanny's saying to me, baby, you could be the best, anything you want to be, you could be the best. Just don't play around. Don't put your little foot in, put your whole self in. You're going to be the best. And I'm like, why is my mother, we got nothing. I'm wearing all secondhand clothes. And why is she telling me I can be the best? And their parents are telling them they can't be actors. I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, whatever my kids want to do, I want them to go ahead, just as long as they don't half step. Just go yeah. all the way. Not, Absolutely. Not gonna I'm going to now come to that Tony Award, uh, Seven Guitars. Um, quickly, just tell us, you know what? This is what we're going to do. I, you, do you have your homage? You gave me this as a, present, one of your precious present collection harmonicas after Othello. Do you have your harmonica on you? I mean, well, can you 
give us, you learned the harmonica to play, to do seven guitars. Went through the saloons in Chicago, got, you know, and all that, which is a very exciting story. Can you play us something on your harmonica? For a man that hasn't practiced, it's a little embarrassing, but we're going to try it. You go try. You, you, you have a love and others. such a show of a man who hasn't practiced. I can't, I'm going, I promise I am going to take lessons and learn how to play something on this because it's the coolest instrument. I would love one day to be able to walk into a, a, one of the clubs in Chicago and just get on stage and riff, but I'm just not that cool. You Don't know? try it in Chicago, they got murders. <laughs> Them dudes play harmonica so good, they make, you throw, they make me throw mine in the water. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ruben, I could talk to you all day, but we have to open up to the many questions that are waiting for you online now. So why don't we get Michelle to start funneling some of them through? Hi guys. Um, Hi. So sorry if I ask any questions that have already been talked about. I got kicked out for about 45 minutes. So I haven't seen most of this, unfortunately. Oh my God, you were kicked out. Yeah, my computer crashed. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So anyway, so I'm going to keep going. Um, this question is from Renata. What was it like to do Gem of the Ocean on Broadway? That's August Wilson. I mean, you know, August is my, you know, August is like, anyway, I love the Gem of the Ocean. It's an extraordinary play. It was, it was very difficult, though, and it's a long story behind Gem of the Ocean uh, because um, we never really got a chance to really establish the real run, we, we were cut very short. We, we took a two day delay coming into New York because our director got sick, we replaced directors, and then we closed in, on Black History Month into sold out houses, finally sold out houses. We started out so slow, you no know, people didn't even know we were there basically, we had very little advertising. And when they finally caught on that we were there and they started packing the houses, I had to take my phone out of my dressing room because people were calling me all the time for tickets. And we closed to full houses and we had to give, give back hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of tickets. And it hurt, they, and I found out we were closing because this is under the cuff for you students. Another actor in another show called me and said, man, I'm sorry y'all closing. And I said, why? He said, cause we're coming into your theater. No producer had even told us that. They were coming in and then we got the notice a couple of days later they were coming in. So that was hurtful. But the joy of doing August Wilson with Felicia, Anthony Chisholm, you know, John Earl Jokes, uh, uh, um, um, my sister, oh my God, one of the finest actresses. That's who I did Measure for Measure with. Um, Was it Violet? Lisa, Lisa Gay Hamilton. Lisa Gay Hamilton, yes. Lisa Gay, we had a ball, Eugene Lee. It was just amazing. It was yeah. a beautiful play, one of the greatest plays I'd ever, ever been a part of already. Excellent. Next question. Okay, this next question is from James. Um, how does an actor go into directing with no directing experience? Mm, good one. You got to bring some experience. Ain't no need to, uh, you going to go uh, change the oil on the car and you never change, you know, change the oil on the car. You going to go be a butcher and never chop no meat. Are you going to build a cabinet and never sawed wood? Come on, man. You can't, you cannot do anything with no experience. You start gathering experience. I gather my experience being over in a hundred some plays, sitting with a hundred different directors, uh, taking it in school, my master's degree, my doctorate, my bachelor's, learning, sitting in rooms. The only way you learn how to do anything is by first of all, apprenticing. You cannot go into any professional field without apprenticing and be competent in it. I don't give a damn if it's playing soccer. You got to get somewhere and kick the ball around before you can play soccer. You'll say, I'm gonna be good, I'm gonna, I'm gonna teach you how to play soccer. Learn it, learn your craft, be fine at it. It took a long time for me, you know, to, to any class I go into, any film I shoot, any television show, guest star or co-star, I learn. I don't sit at the crafts table, I sit at my chair and listen to the directors. There's no need for me to be in a room with a George C. Wolf or, or, or Lloyd Richards and not learn, or Douglas Turner Ward. I'm learning. 
So I'm still learning. At this age, every room I go in, I'm learning from my actors and I'm learning from my designers. I'm learning from my, for everybody in that room, my assistants, my associates. And so I don't, I don't say go into anything without, first of all, learning the craft and then apprenticing. apprenticing. That's great. I, and I think of okay. that princess, I think of the wonderful Avoye Tiempo, who you've really taken over your, she's going to be one of our great directors, it's clear, because the dedication of, she's working with everyone on, you know what I mean, and just building that, it's so important, that role of, you know. With Avoye, speaking of Avoye, in, 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 in my, uh, the choreographer. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, uh, I just saw that, yeah. I said, it's like, I bring those people in, I know how good they are, I don't get in their way. I yeah. say, this is what we need to, to happen yeah. right here. And then I get out the way. And yeah. I tell him, well, yeah, if, I can't, if I'm trying to talk to an actor and it's not really working, like there was an actor in our cast, he was younger, and it seemed like he was a little intimidated by me. Yeah. I went to Warrior and said, you got him. You, you got, got him. him. I'm and, I, and, I, and I also noticed how you let Ade Sola just sit, I think he's watching today, and just sit there and observe for two weeks before Ade Sola came up to me to talk to me once, just observing, 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 seeing what I was bringing and stuff. And that sort of... Yeah. like watching and learning what, before you speak, you know? What he says to me, Adesla says to me, is it okay if I talk to the actor? Yeah. And I'll say to you, you know, or, or the cast, you know, is gonna be talking to y'all today. You yeah. just don't go past the director because the, the cast is gonna listen to one person, yeah. one general, <laughs> you know, until mm -hmm. that general says, I'm leaving it to my colonel over here. Yeah, well, yeah, go ahead. absolutely, great. Okay, next question. Uh, next question, this is from Colby. What were your challenges starting out in the industry? Have they changed? And what are the most prevalent challenges facing new artists of color? Um, and then in addition to that, what are the most uh, prevalent challenges? Oh, that's also kind of repeated. Anyway, uh, yeah, go, go for it. You know, the challenges particularly for, 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 for anyone, any artist is gonna always be uh, uh, fighting the fighting the 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 lack of confidence, fighting the the insecurities. That's going to always be a huge challenge because you're going to always see something great and wonder, I can't do that. That's that's you got to get that out of your mind first, and then uh, uh, because somebody's always going to be as good or better at something than you, and you're going to always be as good or better than something at somebody else. The things for actors of color, we have to. The biggest challenge is always trying to impress someone else by their Eurocentric views of what you should be as a person of color to fit into their scheme. Uh, that doesn't fit into my scheme. Ruben's too sweet to be a Richard II. Uh, yeah, but I'm, you're hiring me to do Richard II, not to stop being Ruben. I can do Richard II. So you got to get out of your mind or, or, of trying to, to destroy the very essence of yourself to fit into their uh, perspective of what they want you to be to be acceptable to be acceptable in their room. Uh, we wear the mask and we always have to wear the mask uh, uh, as people of color to try to feel out, did we make you uncomfortable by being genuinely myself? We rarely can be genuinely who we are. And so I always like to throw that, that thing in, the, in a rehearsal room, like I, I'd be there with, with, the, with like say John Barton. When I was working with John, he would tell, have me do, you do terribly well at this, do, 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 give it a go, shall we give it a go? And, I, and I'd give it a go and, I'd be, and then I'd stop. I'd be in the middle of some deep, uh, uh, what moved me to it, I would be bold with time and your attention, then mark the inducement. Thus it came, give heed to it. Uh, John, hold on, man, dig this. What if I approach it from a whole different slant? What if I slide in from the left and stop and look around and then I, I gaze and then I stop and then I hit it? John would be, oh, it would work wonderfully well. <laughs> Wonderful. You know, so he wasn't intimidated by that. Yeah. So, so the thing, when you find that kind of person that's not a tip, most people will be like, damn, he can't talk to me like that. I mean, I've had students come out and say, how can you talk like a brother from the street and then wax the language? I said, I didn't give up one for the other. I said that earlier in this thing, right? So, so that's like Chuck, when, you, when you're playing, when they make you play do American accent. Yeah. And, and you, actors come from London, boy, y'all can do the hell out of us. We can't do y'all that well. <laughs> <laughs> but you never give up Chuck, though. No, no. You, you, yeah. and no matter what you do, and we talked about it in Othello, you never gave up Nigeria. Yeah. You never give it up. And I said, Chuck, I said, you got to show me somewhere in it, Chuck. You mm -hmm. got to bring me some Nigeria. Show yeah. me something by the way you squat, by yeah. the way you move, or something that you say. 
Remember, yeah. I said, you got to bring that. And so yeah. that's what I always say to actors of color. It's going to make it harder if you don't wear the mask longer. But and it's it made it harder for me, you know, um, but I was determined to not give up. And well, also it's to put that however much we there's still so many issues to face now. I mean, compared to when you were starting out, things are better. <laughs> you know, what I mean, there's actually more variety. There's more than I mean, I mean, we can talk for ages about the older TV. I saw Blair Underwood is going to be one of our guests later on. And certainly at the time Blair was doing LA law and stuff there was you know you were either the drug addict or the judge as a, you know what I mean on TV I mean there's there's a bit more scope as we start owning more of the writing because it has to come from the creative room also doesn't it in a weird way you know and, and Blair was in that company of me, of, uh, of uh, measure for measure with me measure for measure with you yeah 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 and, yeah. Klein and Andre Brower yeah yeah I mean what a cast um, <laughs> next question Okay, this is from uh, Leah. Who are some writers that you draw inspiration from? You know, it's, it's always easy to say August. I mean, I don't think there's a black writer out that doesn't draw inspiration from August, but I love Dominique's work, uh, Nathan Davis, uh, Christina Anderson, um, people's work that I've read, uh, Kiata Hudes, I love her work. Uh, um, Paradise Blue is just stunning, stunning, that production. Which one? Paradise. Yeah, Karen Zacharias. Uh, yeah. It's wonderful. I just, I, I draw inspiration from the opportunity to read um, to other people burying their souls in celebrating who they are and their cultures. Uh, and it sometimes drives actors of color, uh, writers of color away because they, we seem like we're fighting to make you understand this 85%, 90% white audience understand me and, we, and, and our intentions get wrong. We say, I got to make you understand. I got to explain me to you. No, I'm not going to explain me to you. I'm going to let you experience me the same way I experienced David Henry Wong, uh, Harold Pinter, or, or Beckett. Do you think I understood Beckett when I first read it? Crap's last tape? <laughs> Over a Godot or a or, or Pierre Gint. Yeah, yeah, you know how many yeah. times I had to read Pierre Gint, A Boy from Lackawanna? But I experienced it, and then I saw the production, and I said, aha. So give me the same liberties. Allow me in that same space. That's beautiful. Next question, Michelle. So this question is from Tequila. Uh, we all know you as the director, but what made you move into directing and writing? Was that a natural transition or was that a desire you always had as a young artist? Well, I always talk about controlling the narrative. I, I don't want, I'm tired of other people telling me who I am. I can tell you straight up who I am. You know, and, and all I need is, is a minute of your time. And so uh, that's one of the reasons, the biggest reason is because I wanted to be in control of the conversation of who we are as people of color, particularly from my background and people that I know came up from the South and so forth and so on. Other than that, if you do one thing, you get easily blocked and need one block to block you. You know, and I've been told as an actor, I'd never work again. That was the block that I'm directing. We don't like him as a director. That's the block that I'm writing. We don't like him as a writer. Boom. Somebody just hired him as an actor. Boom. Somebody just hired him. Oh, you got to be a moving target. You know, <laughs> and the, and the other thing about it is, and the most important thing is this. If you continue to be an artist, you must continue to have product. An actor is waiting for an audition to sell his wares. A writer can walk into or make an email to sell their wares. A director is waiting for somebody to choose them. A director does not audition. Some writer says, I want Ruben Santiago Hudson. So that's harder to even get a job. So you develop a reputation of quality in, 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 in control, far as controlling the, the, the environment in a peaceful, wonderful, conducive way to everybody in the room, taking care of your actors. I'm known for that. I talked to, I had a conversation with a director and we got into a big fight which was not fun because he said, if an actor doesn't do what I tell him, I just hire another actor. I said, hold on, is there a common ground? Can we work this out? Can you and the actor find space where you can be happy and he can be happy? No, I hire the actor, actor and do what I say, then I fire him. I said, you've never been an actor. And that's yeah. the reason you can say that. And I said, yeah. and I think that's BS. And I said, and I resent, and we got into it. <laughs> he said, you were an actor. I said, I'm still am an actor. I'm an actor today, tomorrow, and the next day. I'll be dead. Yeah. They say actor, you know, on my tombstone, actor, director, writer, you know. But yeah, yeah. So, so anyway. Yeah. Final, Final question. question. Final yeah. question. 
Final question from Epiphany. What is your process when you get a script you will direct? First of all, once I read the script, I got to see it. I don't have to see what's going to be the final product, but I got to see. I see the essence of this. Oh, man, I can see this. I'll, that's going to morph and become something, you know. And second of all, it can't make people look dumb, particularly my people. You know, if, you know, if it makes us look, if, if it's demeaning, it, it goes. And, 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 and I meet the writer and I say, this is demeaning, that's demeaning, that's got to, and they either say, we're going to get another director. Go ahead. Because I'm looking to build communities, to build communities. I'm looking to build up my community and give us strength and give us wholeness, completeness as human beings. Because all we get to play in Hollywood or on films are attitudes most of the time. You know, so I'm tired of fragments of who I am, of the wholeness. And when I see whole human beings, I'm looking at a great play right now. It's one black character in it. It's, it's one black character, it's three white characters. You know, it's two black characters and three white characters. It ain't about what characters are. The humanity of the characters is so wonderful. Mm -hmm. All of those people have faults, they have frailties, and they have strengths. They have contradictions and they have humanity. And it's like, to me, I'm saying, that needs to be heard. The wholeness of everybody in there fighting fighting for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, as they say that we have in this country. So I, I need something that moves me. I can't take, I'm too old to just take a job. Them days are over. Yeah. I just yeah. can't, because I'm giving too much to it. I want to yeah. I I make sure that the people in my room, you know, want to be there. And I was saying to a producer yesterday, well, I'm going to go to this actor. I said, does that actor want to be in the room? I don't have time to convince anyone to be in my room. Right. I, I, I want to spend my time nurturing what I have in my room. What is in my room, I want to plant, I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to give you the, the, everything you need so you can boom. That's what I want. Yeah. I, ain't, I ain't every day got to go and say, do you really want to be here? I ain't got to. Yeah. I really yeah. don't. Excellent. Well, Ruben, I, I think it's, it's quite, um, for me, listening to you today, and I am sure for the other listeners, the fact that the NAACP have already given you a Lifetime Achievement Award when I'm pretty certain you have so much, so much, so much more to contribute to us going forward. I'm just excited. It's almost like it feels for me with your enthusiasm, almost like you're still at the beginning of your journey. And I look forward to future collaborations, watching more of your work. And I think it's been a gift to have you this last hour. And I'm very excited that you'll be coming back to work with some people later. And it's one of the great gifts that the public brought me into your sphere, working with you. All right. Um, Michelle, can you open up the, the audiences to show their appreciation to Ruben today? Ruben. It's been absolutely amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruben. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. 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 All right, guys. Can't wait to see your masterclass next Friday. Mm -hmm. And uh, for those lucky eight, and tomorrow my guest will be the wonderful Glenn Fleshler um, on Founded in a Nutshell. Thank you guys for joining today. See you yeah. soon. Thank you. Thank you.